Okay, good morning everyone. Welcome to BC212, our course on Christian apologetics. We are starting a new week and um, looking forward to a great week. Let's uh, take a moment to pray together as a class and then we will get started. Uh, may I request somebody to please pray with us as a class and we'll start. Anyone can pray? Let's pray. Heavenly loving Father, once in Lord, we thank you so much for this beautiful morning. Thank you, Lord, for added one more new day in our life, Lord. Thank you for bringing us together once again, Lord, to uh, know you, know your word better, Lord. I especially mm -hmm. pray for Pastor Lord as uh, he's teaching us apologetics, Lord. I pray that uh, you bless him, Lord. Uh, speak through him, Lord, and help us to learn more about you, Lord, so that we will and defend our faith to others, Lord, with gentle and with loving man, the Lord. Once again, I thank you so much. And I pray for all of us, Lord, to bless us. Jesus' name I pray. Amen. 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 Thank you. All right. So last week, uh, we started a subject which is, or a topic, which is quite challenging. And it's the topic of suffering. Why is there suffering in this world? Uh, if God is a good God, why is he allowing suffering? Uh, how do we explain when good people, when believers suffer various things, you know, whether they suffer sickness, disease, or they suffer some calamity, some accident, whether they suffer some um, persecution, attack, or these are different things. How do we explain, you know, how, or how do we try to even understand some of these things? So what we're doing is, or what we're doing is, we're trying to give a, a, a framework. That means these are all the possible things we see in Scripture. And at the same time, we're saying this is the heart of God. This is who God is. God has never changed. His heart has never changed. He's still the same. And these are the things that are going on in our world, you know, so that uh, so that we understand that the, the the pain, the evil, the suffering could be due to multiple reasons, not just one reason, but you know, there are multiple things that are happening. And many times it's the interaction of all of these things that create so many evil things, difficult things. And so we create a framework. We must understand who God is. God has never changed. He is still the same. And then we put these together. And at least in our minds, we can be clear as to how we should look at suffering. Right? Now, to the best of our abilities, we can try and explain it to other people. Not everybody will be able to understand this. Uh, when we say this is what the Bible says, they may not accept it. But at least in our minds, we are clear that who God is has not changed. This is who God is, so we shouldn't blame God for the evil, the suffering that's in the world. Okay, so we're going to quickly review some of the things we covered last week and then uh, uh, go further in what we were talking about. So we said that we need to understand God's heart in the light of his original intent. I mean, what was God's original plan when everything started? And we see and we went through the scriptures that, you know, he created everything very good. There was in God's original creation, there was no evil, there was no sin, there was no suffering, there was no sickness. It wasn't there. And we also said, if you look into the future, which the book of Revelation helps us see, Revelation chapter 21 and 22, over there once again we see, God is going to create a new heavens and the new earth where there is going to be no pain, 
no suffering. So both in the beginning and in the future, that's the way God is going to do it. So it reveals something to us about God, about the heart of God, that it is not his plan, it is not his desire for all the suffering that we are seeing in the world today. So we must not blame God. We can't accuse God. He is making me suffer. He is putting this on me. No, that's not the right thing to do. Because you see very clearly the beginning and the future, there is no suffering. So then where does all this come from? So that is where we understand what the scriptures tell us, that there was Lucifer and his fallen angels. The earth was given to man. Uh, but Adam, Adam and Eve disobeyed God, and in disobeying God, they gave Satan and his demons authority on the earth and over man. And from then on, we see sin through, through disobedience and death through sin. That is, death is everything that is destructive, decay, ultimately resulting in the termination of life, physical life. Ends that way, came into this world. So sin opened the door to all kinds of evil. Right? And we recognize that suffering is a present reality. We can't deny it. You know, there are people who are going through difficult things. All there are just so many different kinds of things that are causing pain and hurt. And uh, it is a reality. People are going through it. Uh, uh, so we can't deny it. And at the same time, we can't blame God for it. So how do we, you know, how do we understand? How do you reconcile this? And then people are suffering in all three realms. There is there is spiritual, emotional, physical. Uh, we can't say one is worse than the other, but it is reality that people are suffering in all areas, physically, emotionally, in their mind, being oppressed, and spiritually, uh, the devil torments people. So we began, uh, so we said, look, in the Bible, we see at least these six reasons why there is suffering, why, why people experience suffering, at least these six reasons. And we're going to look into each one of them. So this is our framework. You know, there is suffering due to bondage of corruption. There is suffering due to people's own actions. There is, of course, demonic work, satanic oppression. Uh, other people do evil, there is divine judgment, and sometimes people willingly sacrifice and they take on suffering willingly. So that's also something to keep in mind. So we started last week by looking at the first point about suffering due to the bondage of corruption. So let's go back to Romans chapter 8, uh, which we read last week and uh, we will uh, look at it again romans 8 somebody could read that for us romans 8 17 to 23 please romans chapter 8 17 to um, 23 please somebody could read it out for us Anyone? Uh, Romans uh, chapter 8, verse 17 to uh, 23. Okay, 23, okay. And if God, and if children then hears, hears of God and John hears with Christ, if indeed we suffer with him, that we may also be glorified together. For I consider that that the suffering of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. For the earnest expectation of the creation eagerly waits for the revealing of the sons of God. For the creation was subjected to futility, not willingly, but because of him who subjected it in hope. Because the creation itself also will be delivered from the bondage of corruption into the glorious liberty of the children of God. For we know that the whole creation groans and labors with birth, thanks together until now. Not only that, 
but we also who have the first fruits of the Spirit, even we ourselves grown within ourselves, eagerly waiting for the adopt uh, adoption, the redemption of our body. Mm. So, the Apostle Paul here, he says, you know, verse 17, we're just reviewing what we did last week. He says, look, we are children of God. We are heirs of God. We are joint heirs with Christ. But there is suffering in this world. And so in verse 17, he says, look, if we suffer, we suffer with him, we'll be glorified together. And that means our suffering that is for Christ is our suffering with Christ. So today in this world, if we suffer for the name of Christ and for who we are in Christ as believers, it's our suffering with Christ, you know. And uh, he says, it was 18, you see, whatever suffering we are going through in this earth, it's nothing compared to what the glory that is going to be given to us, revealed in us. So God has got something very glorious in the future. So therefore, what we go through right now, it's nothing compared to that. And then he begins to talk not about not only about us as sons of God, daughters of God, he begins to talk about creation. Verse 19. He says, even creation is looking forward for the revealing or the unveiling of the sons of God. That means even creation is looking towards this glory which is going to be revealed to the children of God. And why is creation also looking forward to that? Verse 20, because even creation was subjected to futility, with things that are empty, vain, decaying. But it wasn't done willingly. That means this was not the will of God, but God did it in hope or in anticipation of the future. Verse 21, creation will be delivered from the bondage of corruption. So that means right now, creation is, in, is, is enslaved or is subject to corruption. Corruption meaning it's decay. It's a deviation from its original design. That's corruption. So right now, creation is subject to this bondage of corruption, and it's in the future. It's going to be delivered from that. It's going to be redeemed from that. And it will be, verse 21, it will be brought into the glorious liberty of the children of God. Even creation is going to experience the glorious things that we as children of God are going to experience. So obviously, he's referring to you know how this earth is going to be brought into a new, it's going to, you know, everything, Evil is going to be destroyed, and there's going to be a new heavens and a new earth where the very presence of God dwells on the earth. So that's the glorious uh, liberty of the children of God that's going to be re re revealed, which even creation is going to experience. What, what we were pointing out is, verse 21, that right now, at this present moment, everything God created here on earth is subject to corruption. It's going away from its original design. That means the way we are seeing certain things today is not the way God originally designed it. Take, for example, our own human body. Our bodies wear out and die. But when God created Adam and Eve, they were not created to die. They were created to continue on perpetually. But after sin came is when God said, you will die. So they died spiritually, and subsequently they died physically. So our bodies are subject to that corruption. Uh, the outer man is perishing, even though the inward man is being renewed, as Paul said. So like that, so many things are have deviated. They've gone away from their original state of perfection because Creation is subject to corruption. And so this we can understand, you know, why are there birth defects? Why are there deformities? Why are there abnormalities, whether it's physically or mentally, 
of why are there you know earthquakes and weather phenomena that are destructive so damaging how could god have created a world that is so destructive and so damaging um so um we uh, we need to understand this there is something at work already here uh, which is referred the bible refers to in romans 8:21 as the bondage of corruption or uh, uh, the subjection to decay. So things around us are not the way it originally was designed. Right? So we cannot blame God or we should not blame God for this bondage of corruption. What caused or what triggered this was it was sin. God gave things up willingly, but he knew that he was going to redeem everything back. Okay? So, you know, I just put some thoughts here. You know, our bodies get old. Well, the devil is not making it old. It's getting old because creation is subject to corruption. Tsunamis, earthquakes, not all of these are caused by God or the devil. I mean, we know the devil can use uh, certain weather, you know, natural elements. Um, but in most cases, all these things are happening because creation is subject to corruption. It's it's gone away from its original design. So uh, we understand that. Now, of course, God, by his power, will step in and reverse these situations. And that's what we call as a miracle. That means God overrides even this corruption that's taking place and by the power of the spirit that's what we call we call that a miracle god is doing something unusual right so we know that this bondage of corruption will come to an end right there will be new heavens and a new earth but until such time this is happening and this is one of the reasons why there is suffering in this world Right. So God didn't create viruses, he didn't create germs, he didn't create disease. But all of that is a deviation from God's original plan, uh, or God's original perfection in which he created everything. All these things are happening. Okay, so let me pause here and see if uh, there are any questions on this first point. Uh, do we all understand oh, this bondage of corruption, what that means, and how that's affecting what's happening in this world? Uh, and that it is there, but it came in because of sin. And we shouldn't blame God for these things. It is there. Uh, so do we understand this bondage of corruption, bondage of decay, subjection to decay, that nature around us is under. Any questions on that? Okay. So as you, I'm assuming all of us uh, understand it, and it, uh, it does help explain, you know, a lot of the things that the BC happening. You know, uh, that we know is painful. We know it's not good, but it is there. And we shouldn't blame God for it, but we can pray for a miracle. That means we pray for God's intervention to re re reverse that corruption, that decay. You know, whether it's in the form of sickness, disease, deformities, abnormalities, uh, weather conditions that are destructive, other things, you know, we know what's there, but we pray for God to intervene. And that's where we experience uh, the miraculous, the goodness of God. Secondly, why is there suffering? Another piece of the framework for our understanding is that there is suffering due to one's own actions. Now, I think many of us would understand this easily because we know that look god has put responsibility on us so when we face the outcome of 
what we do or what we fail to do, that is not God punishing us, or that is not God trying to teach us a lesson. It is that we are facing the consequence of our own actions or inaction. Right? So, example, if a person, you know, um, uh, is 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 consuming alcohol or drugs, whatever, and of course that impacts certain organs in their body. And let's say then they have they have to go for you know treatment and so on. Now that person cannot say, "Oh God, let this happen to me," you know, my 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 liver is affected. God, let it happen to me in order to teach me a lesson. No, that is a wrong way to look at it. The fact that his liver was affected was because of all his alcohol consumption. It wasn't something, it is not something God is doing to him. No, he's just facing the consequences of his own actions. You know, he's consuming so much alcohol affected the liver, or you know, so many other things. So if somebody was smoking heavily and affected the lungs, he can't say, well, God is getting my attention now, and God is telling me that I need to come back to him. No, God, even before you started smoking, God was always there for you, wanting you to come to him. But if the lungs are affected, it's because of the smoking. That's the result of their own action, and we shouldn't, you know, blame God for it. So like that, there are so many scenarios in, in life, you know, whether you think about a student, a husband, wife, employees, uh, or, you know, uh, people driving rashly, they get into an accident, or if uh, they make unwise investments with their money and they suffer financial loss, uh, so many things, so many things, you know, and we have to face up to the fact that, hey, what this person is going through is not something God is inflicting on him. Uh, you know, sometimes people make it look so spiritual, oh, God did this to me in order to teach me a lesson. Well, if you really look at it very objectively, God didn't do, do it to you. And whatever lesson supposedly they're learning could have been learned without this. You know, it was always there in the Bible. God was always speaking to us in His Word. So we have to look at it very clearly and say, no, what you're experiencing is a consequence of your own actions. Right? Now, Galatians chapter 6, verses 7 and 8. Uh, let's turn there. Galatians 6, verse 7 and 8. Could somebody read that for us, please? Galatians 6, 7, chapter 6, verses 7 and 8. Go ahead. Seven and eight. Do not be deceived. God is not mocked. For whatever a man sows, that he will also reap. For he who sows to his flesh will of the flesh reap corruption. But he who sows to the spirit will of the spirit reap everlasting life. Mm, right. So it's saying, you know, let's not fool ourselves. Verse seven. Do not be deceived. I mean, don't deceive yourself. Don't fool yourself. And just putting simple English. It says, God cannot be mocked. You, you can't make a fool of God. Uh, you know, can't fool God. You can't trick God. And God is not like that. The law is very simple. The, this, the, the, yeah, the law is very simple. What you sow, you will reap. And so if I sow to the flesh, to evil desires, then I'm going to reap the consequence of it. But if I sow to the Spirit, the things of God, I will reap the good things of it. Right? So there is this law, and we can't fool God. The law is always at work. What you sow, you will reap. Now, uh, thank God for His mercy. Uh, the mercy of God lessens or we, uh, um, decreases if, when the mercy of God comes into effect. It keeps us from reaping of all the evil we have sown. That's the mercy of God, right? The grace of God 
enables us to receive what we don't deserve. So thank God for mercy, thank God for grace. But the law in general is, we reap of what we sow. But then God, of course, when we repent, He intervenes in our lives in His mercy and grace. Now, therefore, we must not turn around and blame God for our actions. Rather, we must be willing to take responsibility for our actions and repent. Because then we repent, then we position ourselves to receive mercy and grace, which is always available from God. But in order to receive mercy upon our lives and grace upon our lives, he says, you need to repent. That means you recognize, we recognize, this is what I've done. My actions were wrong. I'm turning away from that, and I come to God for his mercy and grace. And then the mercy of God, he keeps us from receiving all the evil that we should receive for our actions. And in His grace, He gives us even what we don't deserve, the good that we don't deserve. Right? Um, in Psalm 25, verse 15, you know, the psalmist says, Oh Lord, I find my feet in a net, but I'm looking to you to pull me out. So if you think about that, it wasn't God who trapped the psalmist. No, maybe through his own negligence, uh, whatever, he found himself trapped. But he's looking to God for deliverance. right? So that is, yes, our actions have their consequence, but God, we can, you know, when, when we repent, we can look to God to bring us out. And like this, we can talk about many different scenarios. For example, if somebody's in, in indulging in fleshly lusts and are experiencing trouble in their soul, uh, we can't blame God for that. No, this is not because God is troubling you in your soul. No, it's the fleshly lust that the person is indulging in that is causing trouble in the soul. And the, the solution here is to turn away from those fleshly lusts. Right? Uh, we see even in scripture, even, even, you know, men of God, like Abraham or David, they made mistakes. But we see the goodness of God when they turn to him, right? Example, Abraham, he birthed Ishmael. Of, you know, Sarah advised him and he just, you know, he birthed Ishmael. And that wasn't what God wanted. Now, uh, eventually, you know, what Ishmael and the descendants became a big trouble to the house of Israel. But when Abraham realized, you know, the mistake, and he continued, you know, he basically realigned himself to God's plan. Okay, God, you clearly said somebody born out of Sarah and me will be that descendant. You know, he realigned himself. God still fulfilled the plan. Same thing with David. He made several mistakes. Um, you know, and and uh, one of them we you know was, was uh, in killing Uriah and and uh, committing adultery with Bathsheba. But God, when when David repented, you know, God restored him. God restored his relationships. Right. So uh, we shouldn't blame God for the suffering that results from our own wrong actions. But the right thing to do is to learn from our mistakes and and then you know they can we can learn, we can get better or improve ourselves from our mistakes and trust in God who's greater than our mistakes and He can intervene and help us continue on in the journey. Right? And just a side note here, you know, when sometimes when we correct people for their mistakes, if they don't want to listen, then you know, that's not our responsibility if they ignore um, that counsel. That's just a side note. But the point here is this. This is the second reason why there is suffering. Our own actions. And I think many of us uh, understand this and we need to distinguish, you know, in all the people are facing. Is somebody facing the consequence of their own actions? Okay. 
don't blame God for it, but bring them to a place of repentance so that they can then receive the mercy and the grace and the goodness of God. And God can intervene even in that situation. Let me pause here. Any questions on this so far? All okay? all together okay so let's move into the third piece of the framework and uh, third part is this that there is suffering due to satanic oppression that means the third reason why there is evil and pain and and all this suffering is hey the devil is at work. The devil's at work. The devil does harm evil. And uh, you know, we know what Jesus said in John chapter 10, verse 10. The thief, referring to the devil, the thief does not come except to steal, kill, and destroy. So the devil is at work. He tries to steal, kill, destroy, to harm, uh, inflict pain, and so on. And we will look at two examples in scripture and as we do this it would probably clarify certain things the first one is job when we think about job in job chapters one and two it's very clear that it was satan who went and troubled job or afflicted job it was not god job feared God and God had put a hedge of protection around him and was blessing Job and everything was going great. But Satan wanted to trouble Job. He said, you know, I'm going to, you know, go do these things. Now God permitted it. He said, well, why did God permit it? Because at that time and continuing till today, Satan has been granted access on the earth and that access was given to him by Adam. So at this point in time, until you know the, the very end, Satan has been granted access. And so when he said, I want to go trouble Job, you know, yeah, okay. Today, if the devil wants to trouble, you know, anybody, yeah, okay. That's that's God is, you know, it's it's been granted because of Adam handing over authority. To the devil and of course we will talk about what what christ did but in general speaking of the human race adam had passed the authority given to adam was handed over against god's will by adam to the devil so the devil literally has you know if you want to use the word legal right to do what he wants on the earth so it was Satan who troubled Job. Now, did Job, the question is, did Job know that it was Satan troubling him? It seems that Job didn't know that because Job wrongfully blames God. So what do you mean? We know in Job chapter 21, and uh, 22. Let's turn there and read it. Could somebody read that for us, please? Job 1, 21 and 22. Chapter 1. Job chapter 1. Uh, 21 and 22. Could somebody read that? Job chapter 1, 21, 22. Job chapter 1, verse 21 and 26. 22. And said, Naked I came from my mother's womb, and naked I shall depart. The Lord gave, and the Lord has taken away. May the name of the Lord be praised. In all this, Job did not sin by changing God with the wrong doing. By changing God with the wrong. Okay. Yeah. So, what is Job saying? He's saying, 
the Lord gave and the Lord has taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. In all this, Job did not sin nor charge God with wrong. Now, Job is saying, God gave, God took away. But who was actually attacking Job? Not God, but Satan. Right? Now, why is it saying, verse 22, uh, in all this, Job did not sin nor charge God with wrong. Here's the thing. Here's the thing I want us to understand. Job's heart towards God was perfect. That means in all that he was going through, he didn't get angry with God. He didn't get offended with God. So in his heart, he was like this. God gave, God took away, bless God. I still love God. So he did not charge God. That means his heart was clear towards God. But his understanding was wrong. So what do you mean? Because he didn't have the revelation that actually Satan was aff affecting him. It was not God afflicting Job. It was not God coming and destroying uh, his property and his children and causing his uh, you know, livestock and people to be destroyed. It was not God doing that. Who was doing it? It's very clear. Satan went and did these things. But the beautiful thing the Bible is pointing out is, even though Job thought it was God, he said, God gave, God took away. That statement is not true, because God was not taking away. Even though he made an incorrect statement based on his lack of understanding, his heart toward God was right. His heart did not blame God. He didn't charge God. He didn't get offended with God, his heart towards God was clear. So, I want us to understand that correctly. That means, Job didn't un know that it was Satan was afflicting him. He thought God was giving, God was taking away. God was not taking away from Job, it was Satan. And the other thing we see in Job chapter 2, uh, sorry, Job chapter 3, sorry, Job 3 and verse 25. Can somebody read that for us, please? Job 3, 25. Job 3, 25. For the, okay, Job 3, 25. For the things I greatly feared has come upon me, and what I dared has happened to me. Hmm. So here's something we see, Job 3.25. Job had a fear inside him. So Job was a very God-loving God man, a God-fearing man, in a nice way. He honored God so much. He loved God. He would not let anything cause him to become angry with God, cause him to become offended with God. No. But there was a problem. What was the problem? Job had, Job was a fearful person. So how do you know that? Well, look right here in verse 25. Job lived in constant fear. What was his fear? He said in Job 3.25, thing I greatly feared. So this was not a tiny fear. You know, you could imagine this. I mean, how great was this fear? We don't know. But he's saying, I greatly feared something. Would, I, the thing I greatly feared has come upon me. And what I dreaded has happened to me. Now, it's very interesting. 
Job was such a godly man. Because, you know, when you read uh, Job chapter 1, verse 1, it says, you know, the opening of the book, it says, here was a man who loved God, uh, who feared God, and he stayed away from all evil, and he was a worshipper of God. And yet, he had a terrible fear inside him. And his fear was that all these evil things would happen to him and his household. And then, when it actually happened, he acknowledges in verse 25 of chapter 3, what I feared has happened. So, I want to present this to us. That fear, in the Bible, fear is the opposite of faith. Faith attracts God, fear attracts the devil. God does not give us a spirit of fear, therefore it's the devil who comes after fear. And in as much as Job was a, you know, a God-fearing person, a very noble person, a very godly person, his fear is what opened the door to the devil. His fear. And he says, the thing that I greatly feared has come upon me. And what I dreaded has happened to me. Somehow his faith in God did not put him in a place of confidence in God. That God will protect me. So his, you know, in the New Testament we understand it beautifully. When faith is pictured for us like a shield, you know. Take the shield of faith, with which you'll quench all the fiery darts of the wicked. So faith serves like a shield. The fiery darts of the wicked will come, but when you have faith, it negates those fiery darts. And in Job's case, that shield of faith didn't seem to be there. He had the fear of God, but the faith that needed to, or that was needed. That God, you know, the God whom I fear will also defend me didn't seem to be there. Okay, this is just you know analysis based on what we are seeing in Scripture. So, what can we understand from Job? It was not God afflicting Job, even though Job thought it was like he he thought God gave, God took away. That was a wrong understanding. But the beautiful thing about Job is, even though he didn't have proper understanding, his heart toward God was so good. He didn't charge God. He didn't get offended with God. He didn't get angry with God. He didn't blame God. But Job makes a confession that gives us some insight into what was happening spiritually. He was living under terrible fear. And why that fear, we don't know. Because you know, we should have... You know, he should have been in a place where his faith, in, his faith, his fear towards God should have kept him in a faith, place of faith in God. Somehow that didn't happen. The last thing we can also see is that even though Job went through so many problems, um, Job, the book of Job, um, Bible scholars will tell us, uh, accounts for one year of Job's life. That means in the course of a year, he went through all of this and the whole all the conversations he had with his friends, you know, was it all happened in one year. And when you come to the end of the book of Job, Job chapter 42, what do we see God do for Job? We see God bring about a, such a tremendous change that over time God restores him twice as much of what he had lost, everything and much more, double. So God is not the one who took away from Job. God is the one who doubled what Job had, at, you know, having gone through the trial. So Job realized that it was God who blessed him with twice as much as he had. Satan came to steal, kill, and destroy. But God, you know, when Job forgave his friends and did what God told him to do, God put back in his life twice as much. So, 
think about this. Um, we will come back after the break, and I, you know, I would like us to take some questions about Joe. Uh, any thoughts? Any questions? So then we will look at Paul as well. The the, the point here is about Job is it was Satan who caused all these calamities, all these problems. It was not God causing it. It was not God who inflicted the calamities on Job. But the beautiful thing was Job was so patient. He kept his heart free from any offense toward God. And that's why the New Testament points back to Job in James chapter 5 and says, look at the endurance of Job. You know, look at how he went through what he went through and see the end of the Lord, see what God did for him in the end. Now that should encourage us that God always blesses the end. The end is better than what we go through. Okay, so let's stick. Let's pause now. We can uh, go for our short break, and uh, let's get back together. And if you have any questions, I will take it up uh, on 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 the Book of Job. All right, and then we'll go forward. Okay, see you in ten minutes. Thank you. <laughs> 